Okay, the doors are closed. Nobody leaves. Okay, so uh, welcome. This is uh, Should I uh, Stay or Should I Go? Uh, and um, I am delighted to be able to be here with you. And we have, this, we have a wonderful panel, uh, some very smart and very experienced people, uh, to talk about what is um, a difficult issue and one that we all wish we didn't have to grapple with. Uh, but before we get to the fun part, I have some announcements that I have to make. And if you've been to any panel discussions, you've already heard these announcements, uh, most of them. But this one you have not heard, uh, which is that Mazen, Mazen Basrawi on the end, uh, is participating in his personal capacity and is not representing the views of the Department of Justice. And for that, I think we're grateful. Um, <laughs> cell phones, turn them off or silence them. Uh, Twitter, you've all heard the hashtag, hashtag ACS2017. Uh, um, uh, for the Q&A, and we're going to try to save at least 20 minutes at the end for Q&A, uh, there will be a handheld microphone, I'm told, uh, and you need to talk into it for recording purposes. And uh, CLE, you've probably already confronted the CLE table outside, uh, but you need to sign up. Okay, any questions? Okay, having said that, um, these are, as you have uh, heard over the last uh, day and a half, extraordinarily challenging times. And nowhere are they more challenging uh, than in the federal government and among the people, the career people who work for the federal government. Um, the election of Donald Trump um, was an assault on the federal bureaucracy. Uh, his values are simply not consistent with the values of uh, people who are committed to public service and who believe deeply in the importance of public service. Uh, and I, uh, along with many people, have always felt that that is a lawyer's highest calling. Uh, and I think one of the tragedies of this election will be if it deters um, capable, committed, uh, public-spirited people from getting into public service over the long run. Now, that doesn't mean that in the short run, the right decision is for everyone to be in public service right now. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, we're gonna talk, uh, talk about it from the perspective of people who are already in public service uh, and whether or not it's appropriate to stay and what the calculations are and what challenges you might face. Uh, but we'll also talk a little bit about people who are thinking about uh, going into public <laughs> service, people who are students who are thinking about starting their careers. Um, so uh, having said that, let me introduce uh, the people up here uh, with me. Uh, and we'll just go down the row. Um, to my immediate left is Mustafa Santiago Ali, uh, who is the current Senior Vice President of Climate, Environmental Justice, and Community Revitalization at the Hip Hop Caucus. Uh, he previously served in the EPA for 24 years. Uh, and um, most recently, he was the Assistant Associate Administrator for Environmental Justice. Uh, in March, he handed in his letter of resignation, uh, I think after getting a glimpse of uh, <laughs> Administrator Pruitt's uh, budget and the devastation that it promised to um, bring to uh, environmental justice. Um, the, uh, next, we have John Michaels, who is a professor of law at UCLA School of Law, uh, where he writes about administrative law, national law, national security law, and the bureaucracy. Not that many people actually write directly about the bureaucracy, so we're very grateful to have him. Uh, he also writes about privatization, the separation of powers, and uh, he has a book coming out, uh, Constitutional Coup, Privatization's Threat to the American Republic, uh, which I am told is available for pre-order now. Uh, and will be out in October? Okay. Um, so, buy it. Um, uh, next we have uh, Kathy Carlton Gonzalez, uh, who is currently the senior counsel at Demos, uh, where she focuses on voting rights uh, and a variety of other um, civil rights issues, primarily racial discrimination issues. Um, she is a former um, uh, attorney in the voting section of the Civil Rights Division, uh, served there from 2007 to 2012, 
Uh, and um, uh, we look forward to hearing about her experience and her thoughts on uh, working in the current um, administration. And then on the end, we have Mazen Basrawi, who is a current attorney, uh, trial attorney in the Housing and Civil Enforcement section of the Civil Rights Division. Uh, he's been in the division, uh, I think, since 2009, uh, and has been in the uh, housing section since uh, 2013, uh, where he enforces uh, laws like the Fair Housing Act. Uh, so we uh, will get from him the perspective of someone who was there and the kinds of challenges uh, that he is facing or expects to face. Uh, so um, let, me, let me get us started. Um, whenever there is a transition, whenever there is a change in administration, uh, there is great uncertainty <clears throat> in the bureaucracy. Uh, and sometimes it's warranted, sometimes it's not. But there is always uncertainty simply because there are new people coming in. Uh, people who have been there for years have established their place uh, in the organization. Uh, they understand how they think the organization should work. They know the norms by which the organization conducts itself. And there, always, there is always concern that someone who's going to come in who doesn't understand, who doesn't share the mission of the organization, who is going to shake things up, who's going to bring in people who are going to make life difficult and make it impossible for people who are serious public servants to carry out their mission. Um, that uncertainty has never been as great as it is now. And unfortunately, I think the uncertainty is being dispelled uh, the further we get into the Trump administration uh, and not uh, in, in a favorable way. Um, the, uh, this administration is, is astonishing in many ways, obviously, as we're learning uh, from the president on down. The president. Uh, uh, is untruthful. Uh, those of you who heard the plenary panel this morning, I think, heard a really um, compelling description of the, the great threat that he poses to American society with his assault on the truth. Um, the, uh, but as we go down the chain, um, you know, he has, he has appointed people uh, to uh, many of agencies um, who have been outspoken opponents of the mission of the agency. Uh, that obviously does not bode well uh, for the work that people in the agencies are going to be expected to do. So whether it's, you know, Rick Perry at the Energy Department, which if he could have remembered the name, he would have wanted to abolish, <laughs> uh, you know, or whether it's Scott Pruitt at the EPA uh, or Tom Price at HHS. These are people who oppose the mission of their agencies. Uh, and naturally, the people who have worked in those agencies for years are deeply committed to those missions. So. Uh, the tension is, um, is set up. Um, but another very strange characteristic, I think, of this administration is that it has been very slow uh, to fill leadership positions, to bring in the political layer that can actually make change happen. And I think that's a combination of ignorance and incompetence. Um, I think there, there probably is this sort of residual notion in the White House that well, if we don't bring people in, these agencies will just sort of dissolve and go away on their own, uh, and then we won't be troubled by them. Uh, when, of course, actually you have to bring in people. You have to bring in people who are leaders and managers who can actively dismantle the agencies or at least change the direction of law enforcement. Um, so that is not happening at the same pace that we might have expected it to, um, simply because they are not bringing people in. And in many instances, we have acting people uh, who are long time people who have served for a long time and who actually believe in the mission of their agency uh, who are in positions of authority. Um, so uh, my view is that the slower the Bush administration is, probably the better, uh, but we will see. Um, in any event, um, one other thing that we have seen um, early in this administration um, is the incredible importance of the bureaucracy. Uh, we have seen uh, all of our institutions of government under severe stress, under severe threat. Um, you know, the framers uh, built uh, mechanisms into the Constitution uh, to try to deal with the problem of a, an incompetent nut getting into office. And, you know, from the Electoral College, which was supposed to be our safeguard against uh, incompetence, obviously 
that not only failed, it enabled the election of Donald Trump uh, to um, our Congress, which is um, failing miserably uh, to perform its uh, task of checking and balancing. Uh, the courts have, to some extent, stood up, but as uh, the president um, uh, begins to fill judicial vacancies, and there are roughly 150 already vacant to be filled, um, it's, there is no guarantee that the courts will continue to be uh, the force for uh, independence that they have been. Um, so, um, we are facing these challenges, and nobody is facing them more directly than the people who on a daily basis are charged with administering uh, the laws within uh, federal agencies. So what I want to do, um, and I will talk more about my experience later, but what I want to do is um, uh, start bringing in the panel. And I thought um, uh, maybe I, I would start with Mustafa, um, who uh, has a, a probably the most recent dramatic departure from the government, um, simply to give us a, a little notion of what the calculation was uh, that he went through uh, in deciding to leave the EPA after 24 years, an agency he was obviously very committed to. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, for me, it was a difficult decision, but one that became more clear as time went on. Um, you'd have to understand sort of where I come from in my background. Uh, I was raised uh, in a community and a family of Baptists and Pentecostal ministers. My family is very, very uh, focused on civil rights and on worker rights issues. Um, and then I was raised in the environmental justice movement. Um, so for those of you who understand environmental justice and the challenges that are happening inside of communities of color and low-income communities and indigenous populations, there is a certain level of commitment that has to exist in that space if you're going to work on those issues. Uh, folks got to know that you're going to keep it real, if I can say it like that for everyone who's in the audience. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the folks who mentored me as I was coming up, many of you will probably know the name of Vivian Malone Jones, uh, who actually integrated uh, the University of Alabama. Um, and she was one of my early mentors, along with someone you may not know, his name is Damu Smith. Damu Smith was one of the great organizers uh, and environmentalist uh, uh, and worker for environmental justice. And all those folks helped to make up um, sort of uh, who I am today, along with many, many other leaders uh, who are part of civil rights and environmental justice. And when I uh, looked at what um, the administration um, and Administrator Pruitt were proposing, I knew that those values and priorities were vastly different than mine um, and the work and the communities that I had dedicated my life to uh, for over two decades. I also knew, because I believe in real talk, that the choices that they were making were literally going to be devastating to those communities and they would actually cause more folks to get sick and unfortunately more folks were gonna die and I couldn't be a part of that. And I knew that I was in the position that I could stand up respectfully and that's the letter that I wrote. I hoped that that letter would be used as an educational tool for the new administrator. And the reason being, is that when he was going through his Senate confirmation hearings, uh, he had shared, uh, I can't remember, it was, uh, with Senator Booker or one of the other senators, that he did not know a lot about environmental justice, which I thought was very interesting. If you are going to be uh, leading the Environmental Protection Agency, which has a distinct responsibility for this issue, um, that you should know something about this, especially because the choices that you will be making whether it's for a day or for four years or for eight years, uh, hopefully that's not the case, um, that uh, you can either do a huge amount of good for those communities or uh, you could literally uh, devastate those communities with the choices that you're gonna make. So for me, it was a different set of values and priorities um, and I just couldn't be a part of the, the negative uh, impacts that I knew were coming. Okay. Um Let's, uh, let's move down the line, um, and I'd, I'd like to, to get um, uh, experiences out and, and then um, call on John um, after people have spoken to sort of give us some, some thoughts about uh, uh, the significance of, uh, of all of this. So, Kathy, let's, uh, let's go to you. You, uh, you uh, um, had the experience of coming into the uh, Civil Rights Division in 2007 which was an interesting, interesting time in the Civil Rights Division's history. Uh, it was after the worst of, of what happened during the Bush administration. It sort of started to quiet down. 
Um, for those of you who are just too young to remember, um, back to the, to the second Bush administration, uh, the Civil Rights Division went through a very difficult time um, when uh, uh, the administration really um, uh, took aim at the career attorneys and uh, took uh, astonishing steps to um, drive people out, uh, to uh, create vacancies that they could fill uh, with people who uh, more resemble the political appointees in the Civil Rights Division than uh, traditional career appointees. So people were being hired on the basis of uh, politics and ideology. Uh, and um, uh, all of this kind of blew up. Um, actually, the, the, the oversight function of Congress uh, worked. And uh, first, the U.S. attorney scandal broke. Uh, and um, uh, Alberto Gonzalez and uh, almost the entire top echelon of the Department of Justice were forced to resign. Uh, and then uh, the Civil Rights Division got a close look. And uh, it was um, made very clear uh, in testimony and through some very untruthful testimony by one Brad Schlossman, uh that there were enormous problems in the Civil Rights Division involving the politicization of the career attorney corps. Um, after that broke, all of this broke, uh, a new attorney general was coming in, uh, Michael Mukasey, uh, who was not a dream liberal attorney general, but was a, a real step uh, above uh, what had uh, been there before in terms of integrity and commitment to the rule of law. And the Civil Rights Division uh, was starting to get back on track uh, and you made the decision to, to come aboard and be one of the, the, the beachhead civil rights attorneys to help uh, get things going again. Tell us about your decision. Um, yeah, in retrospect, I feel like times are, are very different now, but it wasn't an easy decision at the time either. So um, I was working at the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, and you know, people told me in the civil rights movement, I also came up in the movement and you know, grew up with a mother who taught me well about, about these issues. And um, folks in the civil rights movement said, you know, why don't you apply to go into the voting section? You know, it's very important to protect Latino voting rights. And, uh, my first reaction was, you've got to be kidding, I'm a hardcore civil rights lawyer, like, that's just not going to work, right? So um, I actually, you know, found out um, a lot about what was happening in the voting section in particular, and that Hans von Spakowski had left, and that Alberto Gonzalez was being investigated, and there was an ongoing investigation about the failure to hire people with a civil rights background at all. Um, and so... I guess based on being encouraged by folks in the movement, I decided to just go in and give it a try. And I'm a person who's been practicing law for 23 years and just spent you know, five years in government. And in many ways, um, it was a good experience. Um, I was able to bring eight enforcement actions in five years to protect Latino civil rights. I learned about redistricting. Um, we know the Department of Justice, of course, no longer reviews redistricting plans because of the, the Shelby decision. But you know, I was you know, part of the voting section at the time when we were reviewing redistricting plans. I learned about that very well. I learned from some of the best voting rights lawyers in the country. And then I guess I also want to add that it really wasn't without, you know, any stress. It was, um, uh, I think, the reason that I stayed, when I think of this song, should I stay or should I go, right? <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody really remembers the lyrics of that Clash song, you know? But there are, I think the reason that the person is conflicted about the relationship is they're being teased into something that, um, tease, 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 right? You're going to be able to, it's going to be good for you, but, you know, we're not really 100% sure. So I felt like, uh, you know, just really a lot of ongoing dilemmas, but um, as I was saying to, to kind of before the panel, I stayed in because of my witnesses and the communities I was representing. So my first voting rights case was in Penns Grove, New Jersey, and nobody else wanted to investigate this because, um, Latinos had been wrongfully accused of voter fraud. Like nobody saw that as, you know, um, a, to question, you know, that it may be a wrongful accusation. And I went ahead and started investigating, and I worked up a case, and it was just one of the worst cases of discrimination I'd ever seen. The police were going door to door in public housing and telling Latinos and nobody else um, that if you had somebody um, uh, if you had somebody on your lease um, who, um, had, who wasn't on your lease, 
who use that address, um, um, at, then you would be accused of voter fraud. You have been, uh, that you, you yourself would be kicked off the voting rolls and be accused of voter fraud, right? And so, you know, just classic intimidation and discrimination. Um, and so I, there were many other discriminatory factors. It was the first time a Latino had run for office and the white power structure didn't want anybody speaking Spanish. Uh, when Latinos came into the polls, they used the F word. They said, if your last name is Rodriguez, you must be a criminal. So um, just to be, make, try to make a long story short, um, I worked up the case and my lead witnesses were um, a mother and her, her mother and the granddaughter. Right, and um, they had decided to um, become poll workers, the mother and the daughter, and the son had been um, wrongfully accused of voter fraud, and um, just the day after, the chief of the voting section asked me um, if I would consider dropping the discrimination claim instead of, instead of making this case only about language access. Just after that, you know, she called me and said the police had been by her house and had been beating up her children, right? And um, it really just scared me so much that I said, look, if you don't want to continue with this, I'll understand. And so she said, no, we're going to keep fighting for our community's right to vote. And so something in me said, um, when the chief kept asking me and I was under some pressure to drop that claim, um, said I'd answer any questions that he wanted to about the discrimination claim. And, um, you know, if they wanted to drop it, you know, that would be fine. But I didn't think it was the right thing to do. And somehow that worked out and they was able to bring the claim. I think it was because of all the politics behind it. But that's kind of what I took into account is, um, you know, the good that I could do at that time. Um, with with the badge, right? With the power of the badge. Right, and then, and, and, and then the advantage, of course, was that that when President Obama was elected, you, you were there. Yes. And and, and and as the voting section became uh, much more proactive, uh, you were there with experience and able to take off. Yeah, it turned out to be a really good experience in the long run. But there were, you know, I think that year between 2007 and 2008, you know just lots of investigations of the staff in the voting section. Jay Christian Adams, you know, wrote a book about colleagues. Um, you know, pictures of my office are in that book. And so there's just a lot of, a lot of, a lot of um, things that were very difficult and uncomfortable. But um, you do have, we did have, you know, a structure where if you sort of follow the rules and follow the law, like that, that there is an idea that, you know, you could have differences of opinion or you could be wrongfully investigated, but you'll be okay. Yeah, I wonder about that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, let me let me let me interject at this point because I mean I you know I I um, transitioned between um, a number of administrations, starting with the Carter administration through Bush two, um, and and my calculation always was, and this is I mean starting from the Reagan administration, um, that as long as I felt that I could do some good work, it was worth staying. Mm -hmm. You know, and as long as the sort of the avenues were open for discussion within the organization where you might be able to persuade political people that they should bring this case or that case. Uh, as long as we could make reasonable arguments in court uh, and pursue um, um, basic civil rights issues, uh, it was worth staying. And what I found through, um, particularly through the Reagan and, and first Bush administrations, uh, was that you could do that. It was, it was a lawyerly environment where uh, decisions were often based on legal arguments. There were certain things that were off limits. Um, so, uh, in large part, race-conscious things were off limits, remedies, affirmative action, whatever. Um, uh, generally, effects standards were off limits, both under the Fair Housing Act and under Title VII. But what that meant was that we were able to bring intentional discrimination cases under the Fair Housing Act, under Title VII, uh, and, um, and, and do some good work. Um, what I found the difference to be between that period and the second Bush administration uh, was the assault on the career people. Mm -hmm. um, it was no longer about having lawyerly disagreements over how to enforce the law. Uh, it was more about, you are a dangerous liberal, you don't belong here, we don't want you in the organization. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the second Bush administration seemed to have learned a lesson uh, from the, the Reagan and Bush one years, um, which had tried to, they had tried to bring out some pretty, you know, Bring, bring about some pretty dramatic changes in the direction of civil rights enforcement, but they had done it from the top down. Uh, and uh, what the second Bush administration decided was uh, that that hadn't worked, because as soon as administrations changed, those career lawyers were still there, and they were gonna go back to being hardcore civil rights lawyers. 
Um, so they decided to get rid of the hardcore civil rights lawyers and to change the bureaucracy and to put uh, in place of the people who had been there, uh, people who would take a very conservative, restrictive approach to civil rights enforcement. Uh, and so that became a, just an untenable environment. Um, and so um, on that note, Mazen, I, I turn to you. Um, I know that you have been doing good work. Um, and apparently, so far, you think that you can, there's a, there's a possibility you can continue to do that. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Forgive me. I'm a little under the weather. Um, I, I came into the Civil Rights Division as, as counsel to Tom Perez, and one of the first things that we discussed was what, what are we going to do about this uh, about this IG report that had been issued, uh, talking about all of the crazy things that Schlaz and others have did in un, under the Bush administration, and Tom took the approach. Um, that was probably the most magnanimous, which was we're going to expect that everybody's going to do good work. We're not going to go in and, you know, try to take out people who were wrongfully hired. They're here. We're going to treat everybody the same. And, you know, to the extent that people aren't going to be performing up to par, then, you know, they're going to be um, dealt with from, from uh, a performance standpoint, um, which I you know, coming in from ha having been an activist before then, thought was um, naive. Um, uh, but turns out I was naive. So uh, what, what I have discovered over the last eight years is a couple of things. One, turns out there are a lot of good people that actually were hired under the Bush administration. Um, not, to, not to validate their practices. They're, they're, they were awful. But that is to say that uh, there, there were conservatives that were hired who are excellent civil rights lawyers and who are full-throated supporters of, of civil rights work. That being said, you know, they probably are not you know, the, the envelope pushers in the office in terms of pushing the law in a direction that progressives uh, want to, for example, uh, interpreting Title VII to encompass gender identity and things like that. Um, but, or, or are not necessarily the biggest fans of, of the uh, uh, non-intentional type of, of discrimination cases, but they're good lawyers and, and served as good lawyers. Um, and, and so that was sort of lesson one that, that I have learned. And, and as a career person now who's been there for a while, uh, I think there's a lot of value to, to, to ideological diversity, even among the civil rights staff. Um, because, I mean, if for no other reason, like civil rights should not be a, uh, a, a, a partisan issue, right? Civil rights is an American issue. They're American values of non-discrimination. Now, we can disagree about what that means, and we can have different points of view, on you know what is and is not discrimination, but we all agree that di that discrimination on the basis of race, religion, national origin, gender, and disability is wrong, and is illegal, and on you know and for housing and public accommodations and uh, uh, employment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that that's that's sort of my first standpoint is you know uh, ideological purity is not uh, is not a positive goal. I think I think it's good to have. Uh, diversity. Second is I, I'm I'm glad to report to all of you that uh, it is this so far has not been the the Bush administration part two. Uh, the folks that they've brought in in the head of the Civil Rights Division now and and granted they are acting um, are are what I think people would recognize as traditional Republican. Uh, uh, lawyers who have obviously conservative viewpoints, but who are not taking an ax to the Civil Rights Division in the way that uh, some elements of the Bush administration did. And I don't think, it, by the way, I don't think it was the entire Bush administration. Like, Ralph Boyd was a pretty good guy, um, you know, and Juan Kim. Um, so, so there were, like, actual bad people in the Bush administration who did bad things. Um, uh, well. So I, I, don't, I don't think we should debate Ralph Boyd and Juan Kim. We may disagree. What's that? <laughs> I'm just saying I don't think we should debate personalities. No, no, no. I, I know. I'm just trying. And I'm not a defender of the Bush administration. I'm just trying to say, like, 
you know, don't paint with a broad brush is what I'm saying. You have to, you have to look at individual personalities and what they're bringing to the table. Um, and from where I'm sitting, and I, I think I would feel a little bit differently if I were, for example, in the voting section or in the, in, in the special litigation section, um, but where I'm sitting in the housing section, uh, we, what all we're hearing is full-throated support for the work that we're doing. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's very heartening. That's good. Okay. Um, John, um, the, um, the um, bureaucracy has gotten a lot more attention uh, recently than it, than it has in a long time, I think, in part because it has uh, sort of become one of the, the focuses of, of resistance from within. Um, when we've heard about um, things like the, the deep state and uh, we've um, been privy to lots of leaks. And I mean, I think all of this is, has to help highlight for people that uh, the, the career bureaucracy um, has become a powerful force uh, in government uh, that to some extent has served as a, um, a, a bulwark against an, an undisciplined executive. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the role of the bureaucracy in, in, in our modern government? Uh, sure. So um, I am the least interesting person up here to most of you. I have, uh, I have not been in the um, battlefield, but instead I'm off in uh, sunny Southern California writing about this stuff. Um, uh, that, that said, I do spend a lot of time thinking uh, and kind of uh, uh, thinking and, and exploring uh, bureaucracy. So let me give a little bit of perspective and uh, with the, with the, the qualifier, which, I, which is probably assumed that I'm an unabashed fan of the modern federal bureaucracy. I think it's the, one of the great achievements of the, of the 20th century. It's kind of uh, the personnel elements of the uh, 20th century administrative state are often overlooked, um, but are quite remarkable, uh, along with the major kind of substantive achievements as well. Um, so, but if you think about in the kind of the, the history that basically covers a lot of the folks up here, um, uh, starting in the kind of 70s and 80s, there started to be a turn uh, questioning and skepticism about the civil service. It started um, to give some perspective on it, um, uh, concerns about uh, b the partisanship of that, the, the bureaucracy was left leaning, um, and also just kind of the neoliberal critiques of, of government and bureaucracies as being non market actors and the kind of pathologies that are brewed from there. So, already in the 70s and the 80s, we started to see some pushback um, that was ideological but of a different ideological bent. Um, and it was also, um, we see this is when the advent of privatization happened. So civil servants are being marginalized um, as we turn more towards market actors who incidentally don't have the same kind of uh, professional uh, uh, protections, the legal protections to push back on the administration if they feel so justified, nor the, um, and they have very different uh, economic incentives. They're contract workers, they're not servants of the state. It's very different. Um, and we see a greater politicization within agencies, what um, some people call layering, where there's a, uh, more and more layers of assistant secretaries and deputy assistant secretaries. And then um, what, what I think you folks call Schedule C employees, um, which are political appointees who are special aides, special counsels. And you get this thickening of the, the political leadership um, uh, pushing down on the role of bureaucracy, the status of bureaucracy, and their ability to um, effectuate all the changes um, uh, that they've committed themselves to making. Uh, and again, this, is, this has been happening through the 70s, the 80s, into the 90s. It gets much more political in the 2000s for the reasons that were um, already um, really well uh, amplified here um, by my colleagues. Um, and now we're in this period of um, where the, the rhetoric has become so charged. And it's not just a kind of an insider's game where maybe you know, the kind of Republican elite might be trying to uh, diminish or debase the bureaucracy, but we get these kind of grassroots outrage over unelected bureaucrats. And we hear a lot of language about draining the swamp and this idea about a deep state that somehow is going to thwart the intentions or the political mandate of uh, of the president, and if, if I may just say a couple of words on that, um, uh, I I um, 
I kind of embrace this, this notion of the deep state. I think it's actually, um, it's not what it's being characterized in, in, the, in the media as like makes us similar to Turkey or to Pakistan without getting too far into the comparative realm. I actually think it's the, those states are quite shallow because they're so vulnerable to a few people of essentially effectuating great, great change and, and often radical change. But the depth of the, the civil service and the number of people who are working and, and doing the right thing across, regardless of their political affiliations, regardless of what administration they came in, that it's really hard to um, uh, disrupt the ship of state as it were. And I think that's a, that's a great strength and it shows an intergenerational stability of the sort that we often admire in the federal judiciary. And I think we should admire it also in the bureaucracy. Thank you. So Mustafa, let me come back to you and, and, and uh, sort of get this on a more individual level. So say, say a, a young attorney were to come to you uh, with a deep interest in environmental justice or environmental law generally, uh, and an interest in public service, and say it's always been my goal to work for the EPA, should I do it? The answer is yes, um, but you have to bring with you authenticity. It's funny, someone just had that conversation with me literally uh, right before we came into the room. I was eavesdropping. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, I was like, you're good. <laughs> um, I think it's important to have uh, strong folks both inside and outside. Um, on the issues that I work on, that has always been a part of the overall strategy to be able to be able to move forward. But I think you have to just realize what you're walking into, and there's going to be uh, an additional set of skills that will be necessary uh, for you to be able to accomplish what I hope um, are the goals that will be beneficial to communities. The other thing that I always share with folks, um, you know, from business leaders to, you know, folks who are in local governments, is that if you're going to do the work and if you're a new attorney, you have to spend the time and, and folks have to know that you're going to be authentic. And the reason for that is because there have been a lot of broken promises to communities of color and indigenous populations and low-income communities, and they often felt forgotten and they think that their voice doesn't matter. So as a new person, um, like in any industry or business, you've got to you know, one, you've got to be authentic. Two, you've got to put the time in that's necessary um, to make sure that that work is going to be legitimate. And you're going to have tough days. Um, and you're going to probably be asked to do things, and you're going to have to decide what your moral compass is and how you're going to address those issues. Um, one of the things that I always share with folks is that most folks across the country don't know that when you work for the federal government that you raise your right hand and you take that oath just like the president does, just like uh, other members uh, of the various federal families. And you have to be very, very serious about that and understand that commitment. Um, and that commitment is not to the commander in chief, um, but it's to the country, it's to the constitution, so forth and so on, um, and how that connects. Um, so I always tell folks, yes, please come. It's a great experience. I never thought in a million years that I would work for the federal government. I actually started as a student uh, doing an internship and things just kind of moved from there. Um, it is a fantastic opportunity, uh, and if you do it right, you can really be a part of transformation. I guess the question is whether the opportunity is there now to do it right. That's a tough question. Uh, that's like the yeah, that's, that's the hard one, question. Yeah. <laughs> it is. I, I think that I think that there is, but you just have to do it a little bit different, um, uh, and it's much tougher. Um, and I think it varies also depending on what agency or department that you're in and the folks who are leading that. I will share this because I literally talk to probably thousands of folks who still work inside of the federal family. Um, most of those conversations have been, you know, sort of uh, unofficial. Let me say it that way so I don't get anybody in trouble. Um, that folks who are still inside of the federal family are striving uh, each and every day to find traction and to do their jobs the way that they know that they need to be done. Um, so yes, it's gonna to be tougher. Um, yes, I still see it as a, a great opportunity for those who are interested in that space. Um, for me, I knew that it would be extremely difficult. I worked under in five administrations, um, right at the end of one and then, um, or I should say at the beginning of this one. And so I understand that push and pull that's there uh, for you to want to be able to do a good job and to do an authentic job. Um, and I think that there are still spaces and places that that can happen. Um, Kathy, let me ask you a, a similar question. 
um, a uh, young voting rights attorney or a student coming out of law school with an interest in voting rights, um, very eager to um, enforce Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, and then comes to you and asks you, should I go to DOJ? Um, I think that it depends a lot on what section you're in and, um, voting. you know, voting, right? Exactly. So as Maisel said, you know, voting and special litigation are places that are different under the Trump administration. And I think you need to look at the facts and, um, you know, just also, you know, talk to folks who've been there, talk to folks who are still in there, you know, talk to your mentors. Everyone is always, you know, happy to, to help you with the decision. But I think the factors that I took into account are not there any longer and the proof is in the pudding. I think folks who are still in there, I want to just send them a lot of love. They're doing great work. They're going to keep doing great work and keep pushing to be able to bring um, Section 2 claims, um, which, are, which is an anti-discrimination claim, right? Um, and it's exactly the claim that I was pressured to drop. Um, you know, are there Section 2 claims being brought under this administration? And what's happening with the ongoing cases? So in the Texas voter ID case, you know, this when the administration changed the position on whether or not that intentionally discriminatory law, um, you know, should be litigated as intentionally discriminatory, it changed immediately, right? So, um, you know, we can see some changes happening in the voting section. And in the special litigation section, um, you know, I've heard um, that, um, and this is a public knowledge, that the consent decrees are being reviewed, the consent decrees with the police in um, Baltimore. Luckily, that one was able to stay in place, but now the consent decree with, you know, the city of Chicago is being reviewed, and, and those were, you know, some of the most important cases brought under the Obama administration. With immigration, you might as well just have every bad actor in the anti-immigrant movement, you know, running things, and I think you'd have to just, um, you know, think about how much you care about the issue and the community where you come from and what your other options are. We're hiring at Demos, right? Um, <laughs> so, you know, what are your other options? There are some, you know, pluses and minuses to every job, right? Um, but I think that, you know, um, just to see, just be realistic and honest about how much power you're going to have. And then I also wanted to say, um, that I really admire folks who leave on principle. I think it also makes a difference if you were to say, you know, look, you made me drop my Section 2 claim and I, I can't abide by this any longer. I'm going to be resigning, you know, because of that, right? And so, I mean, I think there's also that option too, to go in, see how you're doing, and, you know, see, see how far it's pushed. And, you know, you can, you can resign on principle and then that will be something that will be taken into account in the debate moving forward. Okay. Imagine your advice to a young lawyer contemplating coming to the Civil Rights Division. I, I would say um, be realistic about what your goals are. If your goal is to, um, uh, is to learn how to be an excellent lawyer, uh, if your goal is to uh, act in the area of public service, then by all means uh, apply to the Civil Rights Division and, and um, uh, you know, the honors, the honors program is, is somewhat challenging because you don't know where you're going to end up um, when you apply. But there are, you know, for example, uh, other than my section, the administration is, is, has been very um, uh, I, beyond positive is not the right word, but uh, very supportive and and wanting to put more resources behind uh, the hate crimes prosecutions and human trafficking work that our criminal section does, for example, um, and that so that's a, a growing area of work. And if that's something that that interests you and you want to be a prosecutor, uh, I would encourage you to join. So I would be careful. You know, I would I would look at where it is that you'd want to come in, and I think that's probably true anywhere in in the in, in the government. You want to. You want to make sure that where you're going is consistent with the work you want to do. That being said, I also give people the same advice that I would give anyone whether they want to go into the government or, or anywhere else. Is there kind of three major things you want to look for in a job? Uh, compensation, the work that you do, and the people that you work with. And if you've got two out of those three, you're doing pretty well. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that would be my advice. Okay. Um, so, um, 
I, I recall sitting around with a bunch of um, uh, former civil rights people shortly after the election, uh, and everybody was saying, yeah, we got to get out there. We got to convince everyone to stay. Everybody has to stay uh, because we don't want to create vacancies. We want we want to keep our good people there, um, and which of course you know seemed like good advice. They're good people. They should stay there. Um, but um, clearly, staying can take a very personal toll, uh, and it can have uh, uh, consequences, psychological consequences for the individual, uh, and also consequences for um, someone's professional future. Uh, so it is, it, is not, uh, it is not an easy decision, and it is a very individual decision. Uh, the other thing that's an individual decision is how you behave when you leave. Uh, and I know, Mustafa, you've just been through this trying to figure out you know, how, what you do once you resign uh, and what the consequences of your, your actions are. And, and if you decided that there are limits, there are appropriate forms of behavior, and ones that are not? Sure, although that's beginning to morph. But um, so when I left, I wanted to do it respectfully. I wanted to use it as an opportunity to educate folks, to highlight the issues that were happening inside of communities, um, that um, also that there is change that has happened because of federal support along with others, um, and that we should value that. Um, and I tried to make sure that as I'm out across the country speaking, that it's never personal uh, when I speak about the administration, but it is sort of grounded in fact uh, and grounded in research um, and grounded in the reality that communities are dealing with on a daily basis. Um, so that um, folks have an understanding that this is a human issue that I'm talking about. Other folks have uh, other things, of course, that they're focusing on. Um, and I think it's important. And the reason I say that is beginning to morph is because some of the choices that we see the administration making um, are beginning for me personally to show that the lives of individuals inside of communities don't really matter. Um, and that they are moving us in a very dangerous position. So I try and navigate that, that situation. There are repercussions when you speak out. Uh, my name is Mustafa Santiago Ali. So now when I go to the airport, um, and I have a security clearance. I have all these other things that are in place. Sometimes it takes me a long time to be able to get onto an airplane. Um, and, um, but you can't allow those types of things from dissuading you from the things that you know are right and the things that need to be done in that space uh, and highlight it. So again, it goes back to folks making some real choices um, as you may leave uh, how you leave, um, how that is received also. I was very fortunate um, that I received a huge amount of support when I left. Um, and I think it had something to do with the way that I did it. Um, and, um, you know, and it has played out in a pretty positive way for me, except for, you know, a couple, you know, there's always going to be some, some special folks out there, and you just want to <laughs> give them a hug uh, and tell them it's going to be all right. Um, but besides that, you know, even if it went differently, and even if every place I went, I was getting beat up on, I still would have done it the same way and I still would have done what I did. I'll, I'll share with you just real quickly in 15 seconds, one uh, of the most memorable things since I left. And there've been a number of, of really positive ones, but I was in Texas and I was in the airport in Texas. And uh, I shared with you some of the challenges I've had. A TSA agent walked over to me when I was in line and she said, are you Mustafa Ali? And I didn't even know if I wanted to respond at that time. <laughs> but I said, yes, ma'am, I am. And she said, oh, she said, can you come over here with me? So I followed her, and I was like, oh, Lord. I was like, what is about to go on now? <laughs> and she took me over, and there were two other TSA agents who were over there. And they reached their hand out, and they said, I want to thank you for your service. And I want to thank you for the way that you did it and that you continue to stand up not only for those folks who are in the federal family, but for the issues that everyone across the country, once they're exposed to them, begin to think more critically about. Um, and that is the other side of the coin. You have the challenges, but you also have everyday folks across the country who are being supportive. Um, so for me, um, that's, that's been my sort of story so far. Great. So John, let me, let me um, turn to you. And uh, for people who stay, people who decide to stay, um, and who face challenges 
and who are unhappy about what's going on. Um, and we've mentioned that some will leak. Um, some may be whistleblowers. Um, can you talk sort of generally about the, the kinds of protections that people have and whether they should uh, count on being able to test those protections or uh, is that a, a pretty risky business? So I'm not going to hazard a guess on the risk level um, <laughs> at this point because it's, it seems like there's a lot of uncertainty in the air. So I don't want anyone to rely on this in, 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 in depth. But, but my sense and understanding kind of the laws, the civil service laws, and now, again, it differs where you are and what kind of supervisor you have and how quickly you're going to be written up or how you're going to be characterized. Um, but um, one has the opportunity to essentially voice resistance, opposition, say, I really want to keep this case, I really want to um, um, pursue this, or I understand you want to get to this outcome, but the science doesn't support it. If you're not, you know, if you're in a technical field, if you're, um, the science doesn't support this rescission of a rule for the environment or for um, food safety. Um, and it makes it much harder to write the report, even if you're ordered to do it, in a way that's going to necessarily survive, say, judicial review, if you're not willing to put in uh, or cast a, 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 an agency finding in a way that's inconsistent with either the rule of law or with kind of best scientific practices. So there's little ways. Um, uh, in my sense, and I, I love the term that Mustafa is using, the federal family. I think it's a great term. Um, and I, I think uh, uh, kind of community building within the civil service um, is a remarkable thing. It's a remarkable thing wherever we find it. Um, and one place we're seeing it um, in particular is a place that, as I understand it, already has a pretty thick culture, which is the Foreign Service. Um, and there's uh, both, a, both a thick culture within and also that they're treated with, um, given a lot of kind of leadership responsibility um, compared to some other agencies. But you're seeing people when they, when they have the dissent cables, which um, uh, uh, a, th a thousand names that people, there was a story in the New York Times that uh, there were members of the uh, Foreign Service who once said, I, I got to find out a way to get my name on it too. So opportunities to kind of come together um, and show that it's not an individual that's pushing back on the administration, but it's a group, it's a department, it's a community, it might be people across agencies. Um, and it's hard to find the space for that. Is it rogue tweeting? Is it leaking to the media? Um, it's, it's hard to figure out exactly what, I don't think we've hit our stride on that, but from my understanding is people are still kind of probing and, and poking around at, uh, at what can be done and the creativity and the resourcefulness of, uh, uh, of people is, is uh, in some ways boundless. And so I, I imagine uh, what I would hope to see is, is kind of you know, organic um, uh, uh, kind of loyal opposition is probably too strong, but um, ways of having kind of well set, well prepared, well defined um, boundaries of opposition where it's say, I'm perfectly happy to defer to the leadership. You guys won the election or we, you know, we won the election uh, depending on where you stand. And, um, but, but I'm not going to sacrifice um, uh, my, my responsibilities to the Congress based on the, based on the laws that's being prescribed, based on my scientific professional obligations, um, or to my oath, as, again, as Mustafa put it. Great, thank you. Yeah, do, Kathy. do you mind if I add to that? I mean, I think that's really important. I, I think also, you know, there's always a lot of pressure for people working in the federal government that um, come from conservatives, and so, um, you know, they're, they're, they're former lawyers in the voting section who formed, you know, an anti-voting rights group and, you know, they're, they're willing to make personal attacks. They've made a lot of personal attacks. Um, and they sometimes lead to, you know, your work being attacked or your ethics being attacked. So I found that it's really important to just, you know, stick to the facts and stick to the law and know what the rules are, right? So, um, you know, there are First Amendment rights that government employees hold. There are rules about, you know, outside publications and outside work. Um, and, you know, I was particularly attacked on that. And I certainly, you know, in a different role in a nonprofit, part of my role is like outside communications and changing the narrative and talking about civil rights. You're in a different role in the DOJ. But it doesn't mean that, you know, you're not allowed to 
um, necessarily be one of the lawyers who goes to the airport, you know, when a Muslim ban is issued and things along those lines. And people will attack you for that, but take a good look at the rules and um, you'll see that you might have some support in the rules too, and hopefully they'll hold water. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does anybody want to comment on the ethics of leaking? When you get to that point, when you make the decision, how you do it? I'm not asking anybody to reveal that they have leaked, uh, but just hypothetically, if you were to leak, um, what would you be thinking, and, and what would the limits be? When, when, is, when, is, when is a leak appropriate? Yeah, we're looking at you. Yeah, everybody's looking at me. <laughs> I, I think that there are moments and times where there is value in that. When if we know that the actions are going to cost our citizens their lives, um, then I think that there is some appropriateness in that process. Um, if there is injustice that's happening um, that is significant, and of course folks will have to define that for themselves, I think that there um, is value in that moment. I mean, you know, here, here's the interesting thing. We have to better embrace our humanity. And, you know, if there is an unjust law or regulation or statute that is going to cause harm or an action, then I think you have to really move beyond the moment um, and how this is going to impact everyday real folks. And I think sometimes folks lose track of that. One of the challenges in my work um, over the you know couple of decades was that folks sometimes inside of the Beltway lost connection with real folks across the country um, and sometimes forgot how their actions would play out in everyday folks lives and I think for me that ties back into this discussion um, around leaking now of course national security stuff you know, you gotta really, you know, you gotta be really careful with that type of thing um, because you put, you could put folks in danger. But and when it comes to some of the decisions uh, that folks are making that if you just looked at it on its face, then you looked at it from the law or from a policy aspect uh, and you know that that is going to uh, impact people, I think you have a responsibility. And for me, it goes back to when you take the oath, you're taking that oath just like a doctor takes the Hippocratic Oath. You're taking it because you want to do no harm. You want to protect folks. So for me, and I guess it's easy for me, you know, I'm on the outside now and, uh, you know, uh, those types of things. I think that it's important that we hold accountability in these processes. Um, and for me, um, the analysis of that is what I use throughout my career. Will this be beneficial or will this hurt communities? Anybody else? I wanted to say, I think the whistleblower statutes provide some protections. Um, so maybe that's something a little bit different than leaking, but it could get to the point where, you know, you are going to an outside office, you're going to, you know, a member of Congress, you're going to the public with, with um, something that you feel pe the public should know about the agency. So, um. I'll, I'll just say this. Under the previous administration, um, I, I know that at least in the agency that I worked in, you know, uh, whistleblower protections were really important and that uh, folks actually encouraged folks to move forward if they saw something that was an injustice that was happening. So that's sort of the paradigm that I'm operating from. Uh, if I may just jump in, um, w one area that now I think we've only mentioned once now today is Congress and the role that Congress could or could not be playing in facilitating um, support either um, to prevent uh, circumstances from going to the point where you feel like you need to leak or um, or you feel as if you're not no longer doing your your job or your task and the role for Congress uh, one, one of the things that I that the administration has, has recently either has recently just been reported or uh, it, it's new where a, certain agencies have been directed not to respond to individual members um, request for information and that's you know obviously uh, inconsistent with past practices um, the more uh, the, the fewer opportunities there are for, let's call them constructive leaks or more kind of responsible ways of sharing information, the more likely we're going to see irresponsible forms, um, uh, both in the, in the domestic sector and, and, of course, in the national security sector as well. So um, uh, the moment we find ourselves in is not simply the, a moment that's dictated by a particular presidential administration, but a particular moment at the federal government um, writ large. 
Great, thank you. So, um, great, thank you. So let me let me quickly take a survey. Um, how many people here are students? How many of you have an interest in public service? That's great to see. Uh, I wish we had better news for you. Um, the, uh, how many, if you don't mind answering, how many people here are, are currently federal employees? Great. And how many are former federal employees? Great. And how many have never been in public service? Okay. They're still tough. Yeah, You'll, we're <laughs> counting on you. Okay, so um, we're get, we're, uh, we've come to the, the open period. So I invite your questions, and um, you know, feel free to ask about any of the, the various material that we've covered today. And, and we need to use the microphone. Thank you. Please. Okay, so so many questions, and I know there are a lot of people with questions. I want to start by pushing back on a point in your opening that, you know, perhaps the pace of appointments is a good thing. I wonder whether there's a risk that with those vacancies, we end up having policy by pronouncement rather than policy by process. Uh, when you don't have those policy level positions, you may not have the opportunities for career staff to be at the table and inform a process, and you may have decisions made in the absence of a process. And I was curious if the panelists had thoughts on that. Well, let me go first. I mean, I certainly, certainly that's a danger. Um, it does seem to me, and the, the situation that I was envisioning is that in many instances, um, career people are now the ones who are pushing the decision making. So they have moved up to, to be acting heads of whatever office. Um, so the process is in their hands. And I have some faith, well, I'm assuming it is, I have some faith that um, they uh, would be greater respecters of process than um, people who might be sent in by the president. You look skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else want to? He's probably going to do what he wants anyway. It doesn't really matter what anybody else says. But uh, as a, uh, I'm a, my name is Colin Nash. I'm a 2L law student from Idaho. Uh, as I'm a politically minded individual, but I'm, I'm considered a career in the Foreign Service, and I just wanted to know, just generally speaking, what does public service do to your political spirit? Do, do you feel empowered by the work you do? Does it diminish it? Uh, because I, I feel like. I mean, for all the things we've talked about today, it could be either one of those things. So if you could speak to that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I would say it depends on the day. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I think, uh, and, and it really does, because l like in any other, I think, position, there are some days that you feel very empowered by the work that you do. There are some days that you feel very disempowered um, you know, the, the, for me, those days are, are more frequent than I would like these days. But um, I, th I think just as any other uh, position as, as an attorney, we generally have a tremendous amount of power vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the society, right, in, in the type of work that we do. So, uh, and that's, that's no less true in government. There is something that I kind of wanted to say, and, and I think it touches on this um, tangentially, but uh, the one thing that I, I will say for uh, those of us who are speaking to, um, let's say, skeptical approvers for cases that we want to bring, uh, the reality is we're, when, we, when we file cases as, as civil rights lawyers, we're dealing with skeptical decision makers generally mm -hmm. called judges. So in many ways, this is just putting a, a practice layer before you have to go to a judge to convince them that you have a case. And um, having, you know, having uh, somebody who may not share your, your perspective actually, uh, I think, in, in a lot of ways gives you um, a, a a, a bit of an advantage on that because if you can convince that decision maker in your office to move forward with the case, 
that makes your case stronger when you go to a skeptical judge. Can I just say, I, I think that's absolutely true, but you know, there, are time, there were times in um, the voting section, and I think there may be times in this administration where it's beyond you know, the usual vetting, right? It's something like a pressure. Um, you know, we all saw Comey testify yesterday. So it's not the president right. saying like, gosh, I really hope that you drop this investigation. <laughs> but you know, it's all the leadership in the voting section asking you and you know, blogging about it and tweeting about it. And, um, you know, that's a different type of pressure, but I'm right. glad that I survived that pressure. I just also want to just be honest. It's not just, um, you know, the regular pressure. It's, you know, getting foia it's having your stuff out in the press. It's a lot of, it's, it's different type of pressure than, than usual skeptical approvers, which just absolutely, you know, makes your case stronger um, to go through that process. I agree with, yeah. with that. But yeah. then, of course, there, there are times when push comes to shove and you're simply told, no, you cannot make that argument. Right. Even though it is a legal, legally supportable and probably winning argument. Um, and, and then, you know, that's when you're faced with a decision. Mm -hmm. Hi. First of all, I want to say thank you guys um, for being here. So we've been talking about um, career bureaucrats, career attorneys who are in these roles for decades, you know, across administrations, we've been talking about it like it's a good thing. And um, I, I think it is, and I think most people here would probably agree. But um, we have an administration that talked about draining the swamp um, and is, you know, breeding distrust and questioning the legitimacy of a lot of um, the work that you guys have done. Um, so, you know, we, we're having our conversation here in this room, but there's lots of people that are having that conversation. What would you say to them if you, if you had someone before you who was saying, drain the swamp, you know, get them out of here, What's, what's your three sentence um, pitch to convince them, no, we should be here, we should be committed, we should stay, we should go if we're not already there? Um, I'd love to hear it. Okay, I'll, I can start. Um, I, th I think that um, uh, there's, we need to maintain a distinction between draining the swamp and doing what Congress has told us to do. Right, um, draining the swamp, I think, means getting rid of the corruption in Washington, uh, the influence of money, all of that. And that's at least my reading of drain the swamp. I don't think it means get rid of all of the federal government. I hope it doesn't mean that. Um, but um, my my response certainly is that is that Congress has passed laws. Uh, it has determined uh, in its wisdom over the years uh, that there are things that need to be done, and the federal government, federal agencies, have been charged with doing those things. And they are very important things, like protecting our civil rights, or like keeping our water and our air clean, or whatever, on and on. Uh, and that um, you know, it's, it's, it is not a corrupt undertaking. Uh, it is a very healthy and beneficial undertaking uh, for people to devote their lives to enforcing those laws. May I just jump in? Please. So, so I, I do. I think I'm a little bit more sympathetic to your reading, your understanding of drain the swamp, which does seem to be about kind of turnover and getting rid of the the longstanding swamp monsters, as it were. Um, but I, I guess my response would be that to to probably in a less confrontational way to say, well, get over your cognitive dissonance, because the world is very the, the world is very complicated, and the demands that each of us, including many of the Trump supporters, the the drain the swamp. Uh, uh, we have a certain expectation of a bunch of goodies that go our way and a bunch of services that are going to happen without, without having to think about whether they're going to happen. And those require a lot of hard work from a lot of people who work under incredible time pressures and financial constraints. And then to impose these type, this type of um, uh, kind of psychological baggage that goes with having to justify yourself constantly has to be just eroding and decaying the morale. So I would, I would just force people to kind of take a look at all the stuff that they like about government and recognize that it isn't done by robots. And, and I'll, I'll say this, so I'm a country boy even though I don't look like it. I know people tell me that all the time. I, I keep things real simple for folks. Um, so I ask people along with um, sort of what was said earlier, two easy questions. The first question is, in the last five minutes, have you taken a breath of fresh air? And most people, when you break it down that simply, they don't think about why the Environmental Protection Agency is so important, but if it's not in place, you could lose that. And the second thing I ask folks is, have you had a drink of water in the last 24 hours? And unless they're a camel, the answer usually is yes. <laughs> because there's an expectation when you turn the tap on that clean water's gonna come out. We know Flint, East Chicago, and some other places give an example of that's not true for all communities. 
folks in Washington complicate things much too much sometimes. Complicated situations, I understand that. But for most folks outside of the Beltway, they want to know how this plays out in their lives. The second thing that I noticed over the time in my career, the federal government does a terrible job of sharing with folks what they do and why they do it and how it plays out in people's lives. And that's because they don't have a marketing machine. It reacts when something happens, but it's not a proactive messaging that's going on. That's why folks can come in like our current administration and begin to reframe what government actually is and why it has less value than it actually does. The reason we're the greatest country on the planet is because of our systems that are in place. Um, and folks fail to realize that sometimes and it's because we do not share those messages with folks in a way that resonates with them. And that's what I've done and it's been effective so far over the years. So at the tail end of y'all's talk, you kind of touched on whistleblowers versus the leaks and kind of the strength of the whistleblower protection system. And I was just wondering, these kind of institutional stalwarts that we think about, like the inspectors general, the government accountability office, the office of special counsel, do you think, how do you think these internal but independent agencies can maintain their strength and credibility in a situation like this? Do you think, see their roles changing at all? Uh, well, I'll just say, I mean, I think it's obviously crucial that they do so, that they maintain their independence. And uh, inspectors general, um, as you know, are creatures of Congress. Um, and to the extent that um, Congress cares about getting good information, I think we'll continue to have inspectors general. Um, you know, people working in the federal government are subject to lots of different investigatory and disciplinary bodies. So attorneys, of course, for instance, in the Department of Justice are subject to the jurisdiction of the Inspector General, but also the Office of Professional Responsibility to ensure that you're complying with all your bar rules and all of that. Um, and, and then, of course, there are, you know, there are rules about handling classified information, all of that. Um, and we obviously need to maintain um, uh, independent bodies to uh, conduct those investigations. Um, it is certainly true that most of the people who run those independent bodies will be appointed by this president. Uh, and so I think you know, what we have to, have to hope for, and of course this has failed so far, is that we can impress upon the president that the, uh, the federal bureaucracy is not his personal staff. Uh, it is something that stands apart, that has independent responsibilities and all of that. Um, I think it's up in the air what's going to happen with that. So, for instance, the Office of Special Counsel, um, you know, Carolyn Lerner just, just, is just leaving, right? maybe like this week. Uh, and um, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. It's up to the Trump administration. Uh, hi, I'm Alana. I'm a 2L from New York. Uh, so I work for a public defender's office, and I thought this question might be sort of analogous to working for um, an, an administration you don't agree with. Uh, so our clients come from you know, impoverished, awful situations, um, but they're, they're still people, obviously. And, and what would you say to someone who has to represent a client that has maybe, you know, uh, beaten their wife or has done something so awful that you know it's your duty to defend them to the best of your ability, but you almost don't want to. Anybody? I mean, I, I guess I would just say, like, you, the ethical rules, like, take that situation into account, and, you know, your duty is to zealously represent your client, but if you can't zealously represent that client, then, you know, you could recuse yourself from that case. Um, so. I think um, people go into different areas of law depending on, you know, how, 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 how it affects them personally as much as we want to be strong all the time, right? So, um, you know, I've worked on domestic violence cases and, it, and it's really draining, um, but, uh, you know, you should, so you need to choose. Are you going to be, you know, doing X, you know, X, Y, or Z in your daily practice? And is it something that, you know, you yourself, you know, want to be doing? Um, and. Um, but every lawyer does have a duty to zealously represent their client. Um, and I would also say up to a point, I don't know about, you know, in you know, cases where you're a defender, you need to defend, you know, um, a person who may have committed an egregious crime. Um, um, I, but I think there are limits to, um, you know, even in, in defending someone, you know, um, who 
has done something unconstitutional, um, uh, you know, necessarily have to do that. So just look to the ethical rules would be my best advice. I'm a member of the American Federation of Government Employees. Can you see an influential role that public sector unions could have to help the, the federal family kind of survive and, and move forward? Maybe a rhetorical question, but I'm just yeah. curious. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> so if I may, so building off on what Mustafa said, um, uh, it's about kind of marketing and things like that. I actually wholeheartedly subscribe to it. I, I, I discuss it in some of my work. Just as a just as, uh, quick data point, Congress funds, as, as of the 2012 year or something, uh, $667 million for advertising and marketing for the Pentagon. That's twice OSHA's entire operating budget. Um, uh, it could be an issue where unions help kind of market how, how much their employees do and what they do. Um, because I don't think Congress is, and in fact, there's these kind of anti-propaganda provisions that the EPA was chided for by tweeting about, um, you know this, uh, that's tweeting about um, uh, the accomplishments it did in the year. If you can't say what you're doing, it, it's really, and, but the bloggers and the, you know, the critics can say anything they want about what's going on in, in Washington. You're really fighting with one hand behind your back, so that's an area where the unions could certainly, um, could, could certainly step in. Mm -hmm. Okay. And unions are necessary. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, on that positive note. Um, and, and, and just one final note. I mean, you know, we, we have, we've been talking about public service, and um, it, it really is um, a lawyer's highest calling. And um, I was delighted to see how many people out there are, are actively engaged or have engaged or plan to engage. Uh, and. Um, I hope that nothing we have said has discouraged you. Um, there, you know, there is a time and a place for everything. And if this turns out not to be the right time for you, uh, I hope that you will continue to search for one. Uh, because um, you know, I spent um, roughly three decades in public service and uh, found uh, every decade of it immensely satisfying. Uh, so um, please don't go away discouraged. And as a transition to the plenary panel, you could always work for the fifth, one of the 50 states. There There's you go. There's plenty of opportunities to find your, your niche. All right. Right. So please join me in thanking our panel.